Welcome to the Refuge Sermon of the Week. To listen to any of our other messages, or to get involved, head over to therefuge.online. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Jill Williams. We have to be alive to grow. And as long as we're alive, we're going to feel. Jesus felt. Jesus wept because he was moved to compassion. He knew that feelings were important. They don't control us, but we have to have them to grow. And we lean into that. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Pastors Jess and Pastor Kim, for saying yes to the Holy Spirit speaking to you. It's a little nerve-wracking sometimes when you start to feel that and you think, man, I... At first, you kind of go, eh, no, I don't know, I don't know. And then you say yes, and it's really, really beautiful. I'm going to dismiss the kiddos this morning. You can go with um, Miss Kat and Matthew. You're going to learn about um, how God guides us. They're talking about Caleb entering into the promised land today, so that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to um, pray, and we're going to dig right in this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you that you are worthy. Before we were here to declare that you are worthy, you were worthy. And when we're gone, you will still be worthy. And I thank you for that, God. I pray that today as I bring your message, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, God. Give us hearts to receive what you would say to us. Father, would you empty me out to be um, just an empty vessel so that what you pour into me comes out, that it is you and you alone that we hear this morning, God. Thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, it's a little dark up here, so if we can get some lights turned up, that would be awesome. My eyes are not what they used to be. There we go. I can see it now. I write in pencil. In my sermon book, this is a funny thing for those that know me. I have a huge chunk in the beginning of my sermon book where I've ripped out a whole bunch of pages because I wrote in pen and I kept messing up and scratching it out. And I have this thing where it really just needs to look nice. So now I write in pencil, which means I need the light to read it because it's not so bright. Last week, um, I had the opportunity to share with you all what God had placed on my heart regarding the eternal nature of Jesus. Uh, We talked about that Jesus was and is and was to come. Gunnar, if you would put um, Revelation 1, 7 through 8 on the screen, just as a reminder, because it's beautiful. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. We talked about that last week. We talked about the eternal nature of Jesus and um, and what God had really given me was wherever you've been, he was. Wherever you are, he is, and wherever you're going, he will be. Um, I had the opportunity to summarize the living biography of Jesus that you can find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, I said, I learned that I don't talk about Jesus enough. So this week, I'm excited to talk more about Jesus. I find that I really enjoy it. I really enjoy talking about Jesus. Imagine that. As a recap, Jesus... Fully God, fully God, God's son, born a man, stepped down from heaven to seek and save that which was lost. For a long time, I thought it said to seek and save the lost, and some translations say that, but more accurately translated it is that which was lost, and we know that what was lost was unbroken fellowship with God. That's what was lost. And so he came to bring that back to us. He was born of Mary. He grew in stature, and he served in public ministry for three years. And the book of John, at the end of book of John, it says that he did so many more things that are written that 
and I love the phrasing on this, John says, I suppose if we wrote of everything, the books of the world couldn't hold it all, which is really cool to read. He served in public ministry as a rabbi. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. He did more things on earth, healing the sick, raising the dead. He established who he is in that time. In that time on earth, he established who he is, fully God, God's son with all authority. Jesus lived as an example of perfect righteousness. As a reminder, righteousness is a word we use a lot in the Christian faith. It means right standing, facing in the correct direction, Right standing with each other, right standing with God. He's the only person to ever exist without sin. He never, ever missed the mark, ever. And then he gave up his life willingly, and the Bible says, for the joy set before him. Which was the joy set before him? It was bringing us back into relationship with the Father. He was crucified to pay the price for sins he never committed. We talked about how testament is a covenant, it's a pact, and how um, Old Testament and New Testament can almost be like unfulfilled testament and fulfilled testament, because the people remember, um, and if you, if you hadn't heard it, I encourage you to go back on, on the podcast and listen, it's a great lead up to today. The people wanted God with them. Of, who wouldn't? If you've experienced the presence of God... Say amen. 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 And we want that presence with us. And so they asked God, don't leave us. We want you with us always. We, being a sinful people, being a people that by our very nature could not stop sinning, needed the law to show us, this is what it would take for my presence to be with you all the time. And because of our our nature, we're incapable of carrying that weight. We are incapable of carrying the weight of the level of commitment that it takes to be perfect, which is what God is and what what you have to be in his presence. And we couldn't do it. We could not fulfill our end of the pact. How many of you know that a covenant or a pact is between people? There's sides, God fulfilled his part of the bargain, but we could not fulfill ours. And as a good and loving father, he still wanted relationship with us. What father would say, sorry, kid, you didn't, you didn't fulfill your end of the bargain. You're on your own. He did not do that and sent Jesus down, fully God, to fulfill our end of the bargain And even though he fulfilled our end of the bargain, he still took the consequences of sin, so he traded us. And we said that the living biography was just a piece, as we see in Revelation 1, 7 through 8, that he was, and he is, and he is to come. We saw Jesus in the beginning, let us create. We saw him in Isaac. How many of you thought that was pretty cool? I love that story in Isaac, where Isaac carries the wood on his back. It's very cool to see. We can see him in the Psalms. We can see him in the prophets. We know that he is still. Hebrews 7.25, I love. It's just so beautiful, and that is the verse that says that Jesus Christ sits on the right hand of the Father, and he lives to intercede on our behalf. He lives to do that. What do you live to do? We live to do something, right? I live to love my children, or I live to... Jesus lives to just intercede for you, which is awesome. And we know that he is to come. It is truly the gospel. It is truly good news. There is no one more worthy of our devotion then and now and forever. Devotion to and following Jesus is big on my heart right now, the idea of what it looks like to follow Jesus. So at the beginning of this year, I was contacted by Molly Crocker, if you know her. um, She used to go to church here, and we've been friends for quite a while. And they are connected to something, to a place called Camp Tapawingo. Camp Tapawingo is a beautiful ministry. It's been running for years and years and years, and they've asked me to teach at the junior camp. 
this year, which is really, really an honor. It's awesome. And, um, and the theme this year is follow. Follow Jesus. Follow. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And so I've really been spending time on that. I've been listening to podcasts. I've been praying about it. I've been seeking into it. And it's big and big and big on my heart. And so I'm going to talk about following Jesus today, the one who is worthy, who was worthy, who is worthy, and who will always be worthy. What does it look like to follow Jesus? Hebrews 13.8 is is, um, the first thing that I'm going to highlight today. It's the verse that says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and always. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, so from the beginning, right now, and always. This is important as we talk about following him, because what we're going to look at is how the call to follow Jesus then is the call to follow Jesus now, will be the call to follow Jesus forever. Jesus's nature is unchanging, the same, from the time the world was created to the time he walked the earth, to forever. He is constant. He says what he means. He does what he does. It doesn't change. That means if he was loving, he is loving. Thank you. If he was sacrificial, he is sacrificial. If he healed then, he heals now. If he called us then... He calls us now. All throughout the Bible, God called. He calls. He called then. He still calls. He called Abraham. He called Isaac. He called David. When Jesus came to the earth, he did the same thing. He called. He called. He called. He called disciples to follow him. A disciple is, what's a disciple? A follower. It's a follower. It's a student. Some time ago, we're going to dig into that a little bit, though. Some time ago, I can't remember which sermon it was, but I talked about, I, I often talk about the brain. I didn't last week. I noticed. I talk, I talk about the brain a lot because it's something that I'm really passionate about. I really love how um, what I've learned through science is, uh, because I'm a counselor and I've done brain studies, is to me a little bit funny because God told us all along, but we need to, like toddlers, dig in and learn for ourselves. I knew a woman that said, this is totally off a little bit, but I knew a woman that once said we were talking about how we need to learn. Sometimes we just need to learn ourselves and do it. And she said, yeah, some kids just need to lick the cookie sheet. And she had a daughter that licked the cookie sheet. She said, don't lick that, it's hot. And her daughter licked the cookie sheet. We want to know, so we get in and we do, and that's actually not a bad thing we're going to learn. But I love how uh, it reinforces what God has taught us. We shouldn't need that, but thank God in his wisdom that he gives it to us as a gift. I shared the concept of mirroring some time ago, that that babies mirror, it's how they learn. So Maddie's girls are, when they see her react to something, they're going to mirror her, and that actually creates brain wiring. And God created us to mirror because we're meant to reflect him. We're made in his image. What we spend a lot of time on, we tend to look like. We will look like. I heard, um, I've been listening to this uh, author and and preacher and speaker named uh, John Mark Comer, and he's been digging really into this idea of following Jesus, and he said this, and I thought it was so cool. He said, the question is not, are you following Jesus? The question is, who or what are you following? Because we will follow something. We will, make no mistake, we will follow something. The question is not, are you following Jesus, but who or what are you following? You will follow something. It is OSU Beaver baseball season, 
And if you spend any amount of time with me, you'll see that during OSU Beaver baseball season, I look like a Beaver baseball follower. Not today. But I have, I have orange Beaver toes right now, toenails. And because I follow it and I spend time on it and I watch it and I listen to it, I'm learning from it. What we follow, we learn. I could tell you a lot about Travis Bazana right now <laughs> that I couldn't six months ago because I wasn't following it then, right? 2 Peter 2.19 says this. Things that we follow, we're yoked to something. I, I, I actually said Just a snippet last um, Sunday, I said, oh, that's a sermon. That's a different sermon. Okay, it's today. We will be yoked to something. I go to Oregon Trail, like when I was in elementary school, and the two oxen yoked together, and that heavy wooden yoke. Yoked together means tied together, and where one goes, the other goes, right? Right? Some of you are maybe not old enough to have played Oregon Trail when computers were brand new. (laughs) I didn't realize for a long, long time where Jesus said, take my yoke. For whatever reason, I forgot that that meant two people under one. And I thought it meant that he would give me his. And that was okay because it was light. (laughs) That's not what that means. We will be yoked to something. Second Peter 2.19 says, They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. You are yoked to whatever you, spend, you follow. It will control you. The good news is, in Galatians 5.1, we know that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We will be yoked to something. For people that uh, are uncomfortable with feeling like a sheep, have you heard this? this um, I've heard it from people before, this idea that, uh, that Jesus is our shepherd and he lovingly guides his sheep. And I've heard that be twisted negatively, right? Like I don't want to just be a sheep that follows but we're following something. It's either the good shepherd or something else. You're yoked one way or the other. I would much rather be yoked to, a slave to, somebody that loves me and is for my good. Matthew 11, 28, 30 Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Notice this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When we are yoked to something, we learn from it. We will learn from what we spend time with. I didn't learn about all of the records Travis Bazana has broken By happenstance, I've spent time on beaver baseball and watching it and excited by it and interested in it, and so I have learned from it. It, I mirror what I've learned. But Jesus calls us to follow the best thing to learn, the way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 14, 6, that no one comes to the Father except through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Yoke yourself to the way so that as you follow, you're following along the way, the best way, the way to life. He calls us to that. I'm going to read. It's not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to read a couple of stories when Jesus called some of his disciples. I'm going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This is the story. Maybe you've heard it, but like I always say, lean in if it's something you've heard. I am always blown away when I'm like, I've read this like six times, and then the Holy Spirit's like, not this part. You haven't got this yet. And that will always be because this is a living word. 
One day, this is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and I'm in the NLT, by the way, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. How many of you think that there is, a po- there is the option to be offended by that? We've fished all night. I'm a fisherman. This is my trade. But master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And notice, as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. He called, and they left everything and followed him. Reminder, Peter had a wife. Do you know how I know? Because the Bible says that Jesus healed his mother-in-law. I don't believe that Peter just left his wife, but when Jesus called him, he left everything and followed him. Let's look at Mark. Mark, Luke, John. Okay, it's it's before Luke. Let's look at Mark. Anybody have a story from like, or a song from church camp that you go through for for the books? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Yep. Mark. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple. Be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. How many of you, so the, a tax collector, collector likely had a lot of money. It wasn't... Um, It wasn't prestigious because his people would have despised him for being a Roman sympathizer, but he would have had plenty of money. And he got up and followed Jesus to be his disciple. How many of you find those responses intriguing? So I said last week, and I believe this firmly, that the Bible interprets the Bible. Context and history are not necessary to hear God's word. However, We live in a really cool time where context and history are a gift from God. And I have some cool context that I'd like to share with you today regarding a disciple. I have a master's degree in school counseling. About 2% of the population gets a master's degree, and then just a little less than that gets a doctoral degree. It's a lot of hard work. And frankly, in my case, wasn't really worth the money because I don't make the money, although I love the job. So maybe it was worth the money. In any case, discipleship in the Hebrew tradition is a part of education, like being a, getting a master's degree or a doctoral degree. Boys were educated in the faith, in the Torah, and most were sent home, like at an early level, with the basics of what they need to be fishermen, to run the family business, to do what they needed to do. Okay, think like after middle school. They know what they need to know. They're 12, 13 years old. It's time for them to go work. A few talented, gifted, and worthy students would stay on in the house of learning, so like high school, college, okay, undergrad. And they would study further. An elite few who had great talent, great skill, who were seen as worthy, were invited specifically by a rabbi to study with him, to be his disciple. It was the opportunity of a lifetime. It came with prestige and honor 
and very few people were invited into it. The word disciple in Hebrew is Talmud, and here's what it meant. To give up your entire life to be with the teacher. To give up your entire life to devote learning from the teacher. It was not enough just to know what the teacher knew, to just listen to the teacher. The goal was to be just like the rabbi. We uh, talk about discipleship. We talk about disciples like learning and things like that, but probably a more accurate translation is an apprentice. Has anybody in here ever done an apprenticeship? Yeah, so Kevin uh, is a journeyman millwright, and he did an apprenticeship. So this is where I started thinking about this. Kevin went to classes. That was important foundation. But most of his learning came from on-the-job training. Most of what he knows how to do, the muscle memory that he can do with electrical and welding and all the things, is because he did it over and over and over and over on the job. It wasn't enough to just hear the words. He had to learn with his whole body. It goes beyond head knowledge. Can I possibly be the only one guilty of thinking I can be a disciple by just reading and listening? It's learning with your body. Head knowledge is really important, but it can only take you so far. Here's where I find myself right now. There's this interesting rub that I think happens when you're about to shift into the next gear. God calls us deeper, but we can't go deeper until we're willing to do something. Does that make sense? We can't go deeper until we're willing to do something different. Because if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to stay where I'm at. That's just true. Okay? I have to do something different to go deeper. And that's where this is hitting me right now, is this idea that I'm like, okay, I know God's calling me further and deeper. Maybe I need to move past this and start imitating. Imitating. Owen is in his baseball season right now. And he and Kevin watch a lot of, like, YouTube videos and things on best batting stance and how to hold your bat and what you do with it. How many of you think that, and that, that alone is going to make him a great batter? It's not. He's in the batting cages. It's becoming muscle memory. This is what I do. This is what I do. This is what I do. He doesn't even have to think about it. He just knows how to do it now. His first game's on Monday. I'm excited to see how that goes. He's been working hard. Jesus, when he said, I am the way, whew, not just a way of thinking, not just a moral system, not just a way of thinking, but a way of life. When Jesus said, I am the way, he meant I am the way, the way to walk, the way to talk, the way to breathe the way to engage people, the way to the Father, through me, the way, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The invitation to follow him, to be a disciple, is the same today as it was then. It is the same for you and me today as it was when he said to Peter, follow me. And Peter, an unschooled man who otherwise had already been passed over for this opportunity of a lifetime, was invited to follow the rabbi. Not because he had proven he was worthy, not because he had showed he was studied enough, but because Jesus said, you're enough. That's enough. If you choose it, I'm inviting you. If you choose it, you're good enough. That's it. You're good enough. Walk with me. Do what I do. Imitate me. Love me, live with me. Head, heart, spirit, and body. As it says in Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Am I the only one guilty of not necessarily considering the strength part? That means your body. 
Love God with your actions, with your words, with your choices, with your footsteps. I don't have any points today. Just a question. Are we disciples? As we seek to shift into the next gear with God, as we seek to get into that place where we don't want to be closer to him and we want to enter into his presence, Jesus told us the way. Through him, through following him. Likely, if you're here today, you would say you're a Christian. Unfortunately, we live in a time where a Christian and a disciple are not necessarily the same thing. I learned that the word Christian is only used in the Bible about two times and in a derogatory sense. Do you know this? This is really cool. It was used derogatorily as people were saying like, oh, you think you're a little Christ. You think you're a little Jesus. And over time, and with good reason, we adopted that because we want to be a little Jesus. We want to be a little Christ. But the word disciple is used over 200 times in the Bible, and it means the same thing every time. To be an active follower living the life of Jesus. In today's culture, you can identify as a Christian, and particularly in the Western church, we're really kind of at a disadvantage, you guys, for all of the benefits that we have here. We can be at a great disadvantage spiritually. We can identify as a Christian, a believer in Jesus, and not be a follower of Jesus. A study was conducted where 68% of people, I believe it was on the West Coast, identified as Christian. 68% of people. And 4% identified as following Jesus. Do we follow Jesus? Believing and following is not the same. I assure you, even the demons believe and they tremble. And I assure you, they do not follow Jesus. On the contrary, they run from Jesus into pigs and off of cliffs. But they do know he is real. And they even spoke to him. In the Bible, we can speak to him, we can know he's real, but until it becomes muscle memory and it's in here, are we followers of the way? And until we follow the way, can we get to God truly into the presence of God? I'm going to read a couple of um, areas where Jesus sins, this is really cool, I saw this and I had a lot of fun with it uh, because I love the idea for me in language and understanding that discipleship is more like being an apprentice. That unlocked something for me because I understand apprentice. That's a word I get. And I saw something really cool. In Luke 9, 1 through 6, and then in verse 10, One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples, his followers that lived with him and had seen him work. And he gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. And when we jump down to 10, it says, I love it. When the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done. Then he slipped quietly away with them toward the town of Bethsaida. I'm going to read one more, and then I'm going to tell you why this is exciting to me. See if you can see apprenticeship in this. 10, chapter 10, verse 1 says this. The Lord now chose 22 other disciples, sorry, 72. This writing is getting really small the older I get. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. I'm going to kind of skip past because it looks similar. He, He gave them all the instructions that he gave the twelve. And told them what to do. And in 9, it says, uh, 
if you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. He sent them out. He told them what to do. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near. And in the first story, they came back and they reported. Do you see the apprenticeship? They walked with him from three to 10, verses, or chapters three to 10, they walked with him. They saw what he did. They were, it was on the job training. They watched him. They helped him. They worked with him. They lived with him. They ate with him. They served him, and they served others. And then he said, okay, I taught you how to tie your shoes. Anybody here for that one? I've equipped you. Here's your authority. Go out and practice. Go out and practice, and then come back and tell me how it went. And guess what? They didn't always get it right. They didn't always get it right, but they tried. There, in Luke 9, there's another story where a man comes with his son who is demon-possessed, and he says, Teacher, your disciples tried to cast it out in your name and couldn't, but they tried. They practiced what he had showed them to do, and they didn't always get it right, but they did it. He taught them how to do it. He showed them how to tie their shoes. And then he said, now go tie your shoes. And if they come untied, we'll talk about it and I'll help you. But try it. Try it. See what happens. And he does the same for us. What's been getting to me and what's on my heart is why don't I look like they looked? What is stopping me from doing the same things they did? And the question I ask myself is, am I a student or an apprentice? Am I a student or am I an apprentice? Now, it's not going to look like for everybody going out and laying hands on people and casting out demons. But that's not all Jesus did. He did so much, so much and he tells us to do what he did. You say, Pastor, Jesus was with them. It was different. He got to, they got to see him do those things. First, we get to see him do it too. And second, he still calls us. And, and they were not highly qualified men, remember? You say, well, I'm not qualified. Neither were they. The qualification is saying yes. The invitation is open. You say yes, you're qualified. Matthew 16, 24, and we're getting ready to wrap up, says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if, notice, anyone, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If anyone wants to. Anyone, any Pat, any Jesse, any Lisa, any Kevin, anyone, just do it. We no longer have to wait for a rabbi to say, mm, you're good enough, you're worthy, I think you can do this. We don't have to do that anymore. We just choose to respond. Acts 4.13 is so cool, and I'm not going to have it on the screen, but basically it talks about Peter and I can't remember the other disciple, it might have been John, were speaking, and the um, Pharisees recognized they were unschooled men and marveled because they knew that they had been with Jesus. You don't have to be qualified, you just have to be with Jesus. You don't have to be qualified, you just have to abide with Jesus. And then when you do what he does, he'll equip you to do what he does. That's discipleship. That's following. To be a disciple is to choose to respond fully to Jesus' invitation. There's no special qualifications. We just say yes with our whole body, our spirit, our soul. Here's the thing. No one can do it for you. I heard it this way. The church today uses the word disciple as a verb. What's a verb? It's an action word. It's an action word. We need to be discipled. I'm a teacher. We need to, I need to make sure you're still awake. We, you guys doing okay? Good. 
we do this like, well, if only I was being discipled, if I had better discipleship, if I had mentorship, maybe I could get into that next level. Do you know who that puts the responsibility of being disciple on? Somebody else, not yourself. Disciple is not a verb. Disciple's a noun. It's a person. It's a thing that you are or you are not. It's a choice we make. We either follow the way and we are a disciple or we don't. But it's not something somebody does to us other than Jesus Christ. We can be disciples together. We can help each other grow. But we each have to take ownership of disciple as an identity with the understanding of what it means that we take up our cross and whatever we give up is nothing compared to what we're going to gain. This is why this is why Matthew and Peter jumped up and followed because they knew what a disciple was, somebody of great honor, chosen by the master to reflect them, to show them to other people. And they knew they were unqualified. And man, if somebody's going to ask me, I'm going. I'm going to leave the boat. I'm going to leave the whole deal. And I'm going. Because I know I'm going to gain a whole lot more than I'm ever going to give up. This is how you know if you're a disciple, because you look like the master. You will know them by their fruits. You do what the master does. You speak like the master. You imitate the master. And we make mistakes but over time, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Haley was telling me about a friend of hers the other day. She was talking to me, and she said, man, I was really surprised we were talking, and I didn't know she was a Christian. I found out she was a Christian. I didn't know that really surprised me. We all know someone like that. It might be ourselves. I have spent time with friends where I, in their presence, I didn't look like the master, Likewise, I've had um, parents of Owen's friends text me and say, hey, Owen, you know, we were doing this today, and my son said, yeah, I knew Owen was a Christian. I could tell. I could tell he's always nice, or he's always this, or he's always that. Do we look like the master? I don't have an answer, and I don't have points. What I have is an invitation If you think, I'm a believer, but I don't know that I've been a follower, we'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to join the journey with you on that because I promise you, you won't regret it. The way, the truth, and the life is the best way. It can be hard, and it is still the best way. If you have questions, the pastors here would love to talk to you. If you need prayer, our prayer team would love to pray with you. We just want to be on this journey together, to follow the master, to look like Jesus more and more and more. We become disciples. I believe I have this on the slide, yep. When we grow past the pursuit of knowledge and accept the invitation to become an active apprentice of Jesus when we grow past the need to pursue just knowledge and we say, yes, I want to actually follow in Jesus' footsteps. I want to try to do what he did, even if I mess up, even if it's hard. I'm going to leave you with this, and then we're going to pray. And this is a um, quote from John Mark Comer, which I love. Particularly if you're a busy person in your life and you're thinking, man, I'm going to, you know, try to do something new and be a follower. The invitation of Jesus is not more on top of your already maxed out life, but to breathe, slow down, and reorder your life around what matters most. Breathe, slow down, and reorder around what matters most. And hint, it's Jesus. It's following Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so, so much for your word. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you, and I pray that you would stir in our hearts 
what it looks like for us to go a little deeper. What does it look like individually for me to go a little deeper? Where can I follow you a little bit more? Where are some areas where I'm not following you? I know I'm not doing it in all the places. Are there some things I can do to mirror you more, to be closer to you? Help me to abide in your word because that's where it begins, to abide in you. The first thing that a disciple does is abides with the master. Cause us to abide with you so that we will know what you call us to do when you send us. Correct us where correction is needed, painful, tricky, and beautiful, so that we can grow. That is our pursuit. Not head knowledge, but muscle memory. Make it second nature, God, so that when the world sees each and every one of us, they go, oh, yeah, I know that's a follower of Jesus. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.